Chapter 3 With so much going on, it was only the children, only the smallest colonists, who could run around and play and wander while everyone else was working. So it was Patty and Jason who found Boulder Valley. It was by getting lost that they had found it. They had walked together along the lake shore, finding little pink transparent pebbles at the water's edge and watching jellyfish. The lake had swarms of jellyfish in it, very bright green jellyfish, which bobbed around and oozed themselves into funny shapes to wriggle along. Patty and Jason walked a long way on the beach, and when they got tired, swam in the lake. Then they began to walk back to Shine, and it seemed they had been on the way back for some time, and they still couldn't see the village huts. Let's take a shortcut, said Jason. If we go over that hump of land there, it should get us home a shorter way. Patty followed him, but when they climbed on the hump of land that jutted out from the hills toward the lake and looked over, they found they were not looking down at Shine, but down into a strange new valley. It was a scooped-out shape, gently sloping and curved. They ran down the slope into the valley. It was, it was like standing in the bottom of a bowl, or nearly like that, except that on one edge of the bowl was missing, and through the break in the rim of the hill, the lake could be seen. There were a few scrubby brushes with bright crystalline blue flowers on them, and a lot of brown boulders scattered all over the lower slopes and the valley floor. When Patty and Jason called to each other, their voices seemed very loud and clear, as though the hillside was talking back at them in their own voices. When they crossed the bowl of the new valley and climbed up to the top of its far side, they found themselves where they had expected to be before, on one of the ridges that bounded the plain of shine and in sight of home. Patty took Father and Sarah and Joe to see the valley a few days later when the guide ruled a rest day. A natural amphitheater, father said. Perhaps we should have made our village here. Oh no, father, said Sarah. Think of having to shift all these rocks. I like the rocks, said Patty. They're fun to climb up and jump off. And she showed them by climbing up the nearest one. It's odd, said Joe. I wonder why they're all rounded like that. Glacial boulders, wondered father. But why all here, and none on the plain? Well, thank goodness for that, said Joe. Sarah's right. It would be terrible work if we had to clear them to plow. Sarah was sitting on one now, chanting to herself, and listening to the sound of her voice ringing around the bowl of hillside. I'm the king of the castle. Get down, you dirty rascal. Can't think of anything better to say than that, demanded father. And he began to say, very loud and clear, <clears throat> I wandered lonely as a cloud that floats on high o'er hills and vales, when all at once I saw a crowd, a host of golden daffodils. Then he stopped and shook his head. I can't remember any more. Then Patty said, What's a cloud, father? What's a daffodil? And then she wished she hadn't, because it made father look suddenly sad. Don't you even remember clouds, Patty? he asked, and took her hand in his for the walk home. When she could get Sarah by herself, Patty asked about clouds. Sarah said they were big, white bolsters in the sky that made it rain. But on the new planet, there weren't any things in the sky, and every night as darkness fell, a downfall of rain came close after it, very heavy and sudden, so that you fell asleep with the sound of it on the roof, and by midnight it had stopped, and the mornings dawned bright and clear, with beads of moisture on every branch and leaf. "'You can't have rain without clouds,' Sarah said. "'What comes here must be a kind of dew, dewfall. I like it better. Rain used to spoil the days at home.' The day after the trip with father to see Boulder Valley, the land hopper finished orbiting and came back. The explorers were very impressed with the village, and they had found out a lot. They went up to the spacecraft right away to put the tapes they had made during their flight through the computer. 
The computer would be able to manage just this last task. Then the battery cells would be used up and there would be no more super science from Earth to help them. When the tapes were processed, all the people met in the big hut that had been made for gatherings. The guide told us the news. We are on quite a small planet, he told us all, more like the moon than the Earth. We are orbiting a bright sun, but we are orbiting much more evenly than the Earth. There will be less difference between one season and another here. Such small difference as there is suggests that it is spring now and time to plant. As you all know, there is seed enough for one sowing and a small reserve. The soil here seems fertile, though. As you all know, the plant life here is crystalline and might act on our digestive system like ground glass, so we can only eat what we can grow from earth seeds. It seems there is no life in the waters of this planet except algae and such like and the jellyfish we have all seen. Tomorrow, therefore, we must catch some and see if they can be cooked and eaten, unpalatable though they look. Cries of, ugh, from the children were scolded quiet when he said this. As for land life, of a kind which might compete with us or threaten us or give us animals for farming, the tapes show no signs of any such life over the greater part of the land surface. However, Peter, our expert, will tell you about this. Peter was a tall, bearded man. The children knew him because of his choice of luxury had been the funny little chess set that let you play a game with another person instead of with the computer, and he had played with them sometimes on the journey. There's just a slight oddity in the record, said Peter. Signs of biorhythms very slow ones, somewhere on the lake shore near here. I'm baffled. There are two possibilities. One is that the computer is not operating perfectly. It is supposed to discount biorhythms which we produce ourselves, and so tell us about any other form of life. Perhaps it isn't screening us out perfectly. The other possibility is that something here produces an effect like a biorhythm, though, as I say, an extraordinarily slow one. The effect is only hereabouts, and it's a bit of coincidence if it has nothing to do with our presence here. And nobody has seen anything except the jellyfish, so I think we can safely assume that there is in fact no animal life on this planet. We have the land to ourselves. The grown-ups were still talking in the meeting house, making plans for plowing and sowing, stockpiling timber, and sharing out food rations to last till harvest, when Patty fell asleep in her chair, dreaming of eating jellyfish and being sick. Sarah picked her up and carried her across the open, in the open under the stars to put her in her bunk in their own hut. Patty didn't eat jellyfish and wasn't sick the next day, and neither, what, neither did anyone else, for as soon as the horrible, gluey mass of the fish was heated up, smelling funny, within moments of it beginning to boil in the pan, it broke into flame and began to burn. It burned with a tall, bright green flame like a firework, except that it gave a clear, steady, greenish light. Malcolm became excited and began to try to work out the ways of using jellyfish as fuel. He said that they must be full of oil of some kind. Jason's mother, however, just took a ladle took a ladle and took a scoop of the burning pan into the bowl to make a lamp in her house, and that idea seemed very easy to use. Jason's mother wanted light to sew by, sitting at her fireside after nightfall, but of course nearly everyone had something they would like to do in the evening, and so shine was transformed. For the buildings at night were now a soft pale green, with points of emerald visible where the lamps were hung, and the leaping glow of the fires made a ruby red glow in the middle. The blurred and magnified shadows of the people moving inside their houses cast dark figures softly over the walls of the fluted, shimmering green and sh red shining houses, and shine at night looked like a scatter of blocks of fire opal lying on a dark land under the stars. 
So life at Shine began to settle down. After the exploration party returned, there were no more night watchmen, and everyone slept in their bunks at night. The grown-ups needed their sleep, for now the work of plowing began. There was fuel enough in the land to tuck truck land truck to draw the plow this time. In later years, it would have to be pulled by teams of men, but we hoped that in later years the ground would be easier to turn than it was this first time. The gray glass broke and crumbled and disappeared into the black earth under the plowshare. Peter and Malcolm tried to sow the wheat by scattering it in handfuls, as Father had, had, as Father said, had once been done on earth before anything useful had been invented. But they soon stopped because it was lying in clumps, and some was getting lost over the edge of the plowed ground, and it was so precious we wanted every single grain to grow. So we began to plant it, dropping it seed by seed, the children were better at this job than grown-ups because they had such small fingers and thumbs to take the seeds between, but it was terribly slow going, and Father didn't come to help. For three days, he just wasn't there when the work was being done, and people began to notice and make remarks about him, and Jason's mother even asked the guide what the rules were about people not working, and the guide said the rules had run out and the fuel was doing, and we had to get along without any. Father was making a seed drill. He got the idea out of his book on technology, and he made it out of wood. It was a box on wheels. Father got some wheels from a trolley from the spaceship and put them on his box. It had a row of holes in it, which dribbled a little trail of wheat grains neatly into five furrows at a time. When the drill began to work, Everyone stopped grumbling about Father and congratulated him. At supper that night, he began to talk to Joe and Sarah and Patty, too, though perhaps he thought she was too young to understand him. I plan to be the contriver, the maker for this planet, Father said. The plan brought Peter and Malcolm to be experts, and Arthur, who knows about farming, and so on. You know how the plan goes. But when that spacecraft runs down, it is only metal junk, useful metal junk. Peter won't have any computers to be expert about. We want a different kind of expert, the kind who long ago helped poor people on Earth. They needed not machines exactly, but gadgets, things you can make out of wood and string, things you can make and mend yourself, like the seed drill. The book I brought is full of ideas like that one. I will be a maker. When the harvest is in, I'm going to make a loom and a spinning jenny and find something we can spin and weave. We aren't short of clothes and cloth, Father, said Sarah, and I think there are three sewing machines. Funny ones. You have to turn them by hand. We will be short, Sarah, Father said. How long do clothes last? How often did you need new jeans and t-shirts at home? And you mean we won't farm, we'll make and sell stuff, she said. Is that fair? Why, no, my dear, he said. We'll do our share of the work, and we'll share what we make, as long as others share with us. But we will be important. We will be very respectable citizens here. We will hold our heads high. You don't realize, I think, how divided and snobbish the old world was. Nobody counted for anything without a degree in math and computer science and ecology, and I was just a plain mechanic. Did you ever wonder why we were chosen for the escape? I'm just population fodder, no wife, and three healthy children with a good genetic makeup, that's why. We are just muscle power in the plan just laborers, but I reckon different. I thought, in a world without machines, science wouldn't be so useful. Make do and mend would count for more. Humble gadgets, practical things. I'm good at those. Those will be my contribution, and your contribution, and we will be as good as anyone else here, I promise you. 
Oh, father, said Joe. You're wrong. Everyone in this expedition counts for something. We are all in it together, and all equal. You don't need to fuss. Well, well, said father. We'll see, 